Testing. Okay, great. So, you know, Chris and I were here last year and we were talking about fuzzing and vulnerabilities and uh, one of the common comments that we got was, come on guys, this protocol is insecure. Why are you doing this, right? And we'd say, you know, but serial, but masters. And we still couldn't quite communicate to people that the way that security is kind of being put into some of these protocols, the fuzzing still kind of really matters. So I wanted to come back this year, and instead of talking about fuzzing and kind of specific bones, I wanted to talk about the software security design process that goes into building secure protocols. Um, so go with me on a little thought experiment here. Let's say 20 years in the future, Dale Peterson has completely gotten his way and everything has endpoint security. Absolutely everything. And it's different for every device and it's all built by the engineers for that specific engineering discipline. And we hate all of it. And because we have the Internet of Things, your toaster reminds you how much everything sucks every morning. So how do we avoid that future? Well, I think the first thing we should do is we should challenge the notion you know, if we're software engineers, I'm a software engineer, we like code reuse. In security, we like reuse whenever we can too, because that simplifies things. We should challenge the notion, why do we need ICS-specific um, protocols? Well, we get the first one a lot, right? Well, I thought I had an animation there, but forget about, um, we can't embed crypto. We know that's not true. Yes, there are limitations. Most chipsets come with random number generators and have, you know, dedicated AES modules. We can overcome this. But, you know, in some cases, because of cost reasons, we do have kind of legitimate legacy common infrastructure problems. You know, it's pretty cheap to have, you already have a licensed 900 megahertz band to keep using that, and it's hard to make the justification to roll out IP infrastructure everywhere. And you're already invested in the serial protocols and all the devices, so I don't want to, you know, really argue that too much today. Let's just assume that that is necessary and say, okay, if we're going to secure these legacy serial protocols, how should we go about doing it? Well, you know, we shouldn't take this task lightly. You know, history from IT shows us this is very, very dangerous. You think it's easy, but it never turns out to be easy. You know, think about the last year with TLS. We had every major TLS, you know, implementation had a major vulnerability in 2014, including Microsoft. I don't know if anybody else, anybody saw that secure channel bug as well, but everybody did. You know, even the people who have huge budgets and software engineers that know how to do security. So, you know, it's, it's not easy, but, you know, we do know it's easy to specify the secure crypto primitives. You can go to NIST and see what algorithms you should use. It's a little harder to figure out how you should compose them into a secure protocol, but we know that, you know, we need key swaps and we need session keys so that we can kind of like avert cryptanalysis. We know these things, but where the rubber really meets the road is can we write a reasonable specification that's easy for software engineers to implement? And that's where I think we're kind of failing a lot as a community. We're demanding security, but we're not shepherding that process kind of with the standard bodies and asking for something that's actually implementable. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So once again, things I don't want to talk about is we're not going to talk about weak primitives or bad composition. I think Dale mentioned it earlier this week. We know how to do security protocols in terms of these things. And there's going to be a lot of implementation mistakes out there that are not problems with specifications, right? You know, if you tell a vendor, you use secure random data and they don't use enough entropy, there's not really much you can do about that. And, you know, if they're subject to timing attacks and so forth, these generally aren't like specification issues, they're only implementation issues. So I wanted to compare two protocols, kind of on stage, one I'm very familiar with, one I had to learn about, and I wanted them to kind of be for the same thing. So the application we're looking at is we have legacy comm infrastructure, it's serial, it has to accommodate multi-drop, so we have a single master talking to many outstations. So, you know, maybe it's a, you know, 900 megahertz licensed radio link and it's pushing that protocol, and it has to have pretty low overhead because we've pretty much already saturated that link. You know, if we add more RTUs, we're gonna have to add another tower, we're gonna have to report less points or make our protocol more efficient. We're really kind of running on the edge of what that link can handle in terms of bandwidth. And then the other thing is, we want to evaluate something that is cryptographic, it has shared secrets, so it's kind of a pre-shared key kind of scenario. So the first one I looked at is a protocol called Streaming Encryption Protocol. Um, Schweitzer Engineering Labs has kind of had this out in various forms since I think about 
maybe 2004. It's actually been out there quite a while. And this is based on um, some work that they actually did with PNNL. And we'll see later why a lot of the design decisions that they made are really focused on being able to retrofit things with bump in the wire. So they'd take a link encryptor, they'd take a previously unsecured link, and they'd put link encryptors at both ends just to kind of secure that wide area network link. Because they're, number one, uh, you know, attack they're worried about that is, is that, that wide area link, whether it's, you know, dial up or, or whatever it might be. It has authentication for handshaking, but then during the session, after you've established the session, you've swapped the session keys, it's encryption only, which is kind of interesting for ICS. Like, normally we're concerned mostly about authentication, right? Some people argue encryption, but they usually say, well, we have to have authentication, we have to have integrity. So we'll see why they made that design trade off. And then briefly, I'll mention that PNNL also has another protocol that's a wrapper that has integrity with a full hash message authentication code. That's HMAC for everybody. I'm going to say that a lot during this talk. And that's called SSCP. And then Schweitzer uses that, but they only use it for engineering access. They don't use it for the real time part of the protocols. And then the other one um, I'm going to look at is the sort of companion part of the DNP3 spec called DNP3 Secure Authentication. And this has had multiple versions. I think they started working on this in 2007 and they are now on revision five. It's very tightly coupled to DNP3. It only works with DNP3. And, you know, once you get to the point of, once you're past the point of the session key, it's very different than SEP. But before that, it's identical. You have a fully authenticated session key swap where you're using symmetric cryptography after that. But instead of encrypting the data, you're slapping a message digest on the end. To, to get your integrity. But only some of the messages are authenticated. And I'll, you'll see later kind of why that's really important. And I think I already mentioned some of this. I'm not going to talk. I won't have time really to talk about how the session key messages work. They both use like you know, NIST approved key swap algorithms. You're pretty confident that they're both fairly secure. DNP3 SA has a, few, a lot more features than CEP does. Um, they actually want to do be able to have a certificate authority and push individual user certificates down the devices. If you want to know my opinion on that, talk to me out in the hallway after the talk. I won't have time to talk about it. And when we look at these two protocols, remember, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm a software guy. But we're going to look at it from with two basic rules. Rule number one being have a clear trust boundary. Okay. And the reason to do that is that when you had an implementation, like a, whether it's a development spec that Schweitzer hands to its engineers or whether it's a full IEEE standard, you want a software engineer to be able to reason about that exact point in the code where data becomes trusted and you're passing it into code that expects it to be authenticated. They don't have to worry about, they have to worry less about O days at that point because at that point the user is trusted and well, if they've got control of the system, they'll probably just take over your process through the protocol anyway, right? Um, and the one point that I'll hammer home over and over is there's no such thing as harmless data. And then you should also separate authentication from authorization. And then rule number two is to keep it simple. And I think this is worth reading out loud. This is from Carnegie Mellon Secure Software Engineering Institute. Keep the design as simple as small as possible. Complex designs increase the likelihood that errors will be made in their implementation configuration and use. Additionally, the effort required to achieve an appropriate level of assurance increases dramatically as security mechanisms become more complex. <coughs> so keep it simple. And it doesn't specifically say that on their guide. And that's like a David Letterman's top 10 things of do's for implementing secure protocols, but especially pre-authentication. Because if you, if you can authenticate bugs that are found after that, they're not nearly as severe, right? So you want to really keep it simple until you know that that data comes from some source you trust and keep that different from authorization. Maybe that user only has read access, but you do trust that user not to be sending you malformed packets, right? So our first protocol. Once you've established the session in um, Schweitzer Engineering or Streaming Encryption Protocol, the frames are extremely simple. There's, I think, seven bytes in the header. You have a start, a sequence, and an address. And those are actually plain text. You have a one byte uh, known value byte. That's encrypted. You have an encrypted payload, and then you have a trailer. The framing is done actually using escape characters. 
because it's wrapping a binary protocol, so you can't just have a normal kind of ASCII escape character. And what that allows them to do, you, you wouldn't be able to pre-specify the length of the packet if you wanted to be able to stream it into reduced latency. So that encrypted known value is, um, it's only a single byte. It, it's not meant to protect the protocol's integrity in any way. And in fact, what they use it for is they use it as a way to filter data on multi-drop networks. So when their master talks to multiple endpoints, it actually encrypts each message with a different session key that's negotiated in the session key exchange. And then the endpoints that where the known value doesn't match, it just tosses them out so it doesn't throw garbage onto, onto the line for those endpoints. So it's really there kind of just to address the multi-drop problem. And this has some interesting properties. Um, one interesting property is that an attacker, if they know this frame type and they'll learn it. I mean, Corey over there, Wireshark, he'll learn it. You'll learn your frame type. They have the ability just to, you know, one in every 256 frames, because you have no message integrity, will throw garbage decrypted data out the plain text side of the, of the end, to the endpoint, right? But that's generally not that effective, and we'll talk a little bit about why. But I can think of scenarios because of that lack of integrity, where if you have a kind of known plain text, man in the middle issues could become a real problem. Because what you think about when you have a TLS does encryption and, uh, and integrity, they don't just do you know, just encryption. And that, that integrity is to prevent the sort of man in the middle style attacks. Um, this is just an illustration. You know, the kitty is your very vulnerable SCADA protocol. But because you're only able to generate, easily generate random by its, uh, it's kind of like random fuzzing. The attacker supplied data that gets decrypted is meaningless to the protocol, and because our protocols have CRCs and checksums, all that stuff kind of gets just filtered out. But what about known plain text, right? If I look at enough of these messages kind of going back and forth, I could probably tell from the links that it was a certain protocol, right? I could make, you know, say, well, it's going to be Modbus, or it's going to be DNP3, or it's going to be something. I could probably tell what protocol it was. By looking at the timing, I could probably figure out the framing. You know, I could figure out when the start and stops of the frames are. So if you know enough about the protocol, you would know the offset into that stream ciphertext of where you could do byte substitutions, right? So if I know at offset 13, that's where a DNP3 function code is, I could flip that to a random value and hope to get lucky, right? Well, there's a corresponding CRC, but that's also known plain text, so I could flip that and hope to get lucky. I mean, it's kind of a low probability man in the middle attack, but these are the kind of things that you sacrifice when you don't have integrity in your SCADA protocol. And what's interesting about this is that the, um, the level of protection that the wrapper provides depends on the protocol it's wrapping for man in the middle, because you're relying on that checksum, which you can't control the value of, you can't pick a good value, but probabilistically you might get lucky. So the numbers here aren't quite as good as we're normally used to for, um, for cryptography, where we're usually talking about, well, you'll never guess that until the heat death of the universe. Well, why did they do this? Well, it was simply because we have a lot of legacy things out there, and some of them we can't retrofit, so we want to use link encryptors. And we need to be able to stream the data with minimum latency because, you know, we've already saturated that radio tower, and if we do it anymore, we're going to start missing our polling window. So these are two um, oscilloscope traces. The one on the left shows the very minimal amount of latency that the link encryptor has, because as soon as it gets a byte, it can start chunking out the encrypted byte on the other side. Whereas with SSCP, you have this phenomenon called HMAC holdback, where you have to hold back the whole packet until you validated the, the, um, the message digest at the end, and then you can spit it out. That pretty much doubles your latency for a system like this. So it has real consequences if you want to use a bump in the wire. Um, but, you know, you can also integrate these protocols. You could integrate something like SSCP end-to-end, -end, you know, like on-device and in the master, full endpoint protection, and, and you wouldn't have that issue. So, you know, summary on SEP, it's very simple and effective. Um, it's only symmetric update keys currently for the endpoints. So if you have a really big organization where you have contractors and they're the ones commissioning your devices, you have a little more surface area because you have to hand them basically what are effectively you know, private keys. They're not public keys. It's not asymmetric cryptography. And, but there's no technical reason why they couldn't do that except maybe asymmetric cryptography requires a little more horsepower on the actual link encryptor. 
Um, it's not without design trade-offs, but I think that you know, SSCP is actually a really good candidate for kind of a standardized way to do you know, end-to-end -end encryption. So you know, not being a cryptographer, I couldn't overtly say that, oh, you could do cryptanalysis on this or whatever, but the message structure is extremely simple, a very, very simple state machine for ex you know, exchanging the session keys. You know, if you do good testing, you're probably going to get this right. Um, so I want to compare and contrast that with something that's on the completely other end of the spectrum. It's not protocol agnostic. Um, and the security is kind of embedded into a protocol that we've had around for 20 years. And that's DNP3 secure authentication. So they've chosen to add authentication in a very, very different way. So instead of sort of a lower abstract layer, They've actually repurposed a lot of the constructs that already exist in DNP3. You've got things like functions and objects in DNP3, and they said, hey, you know, we got buckets for security. You know, we'll just add a pinch of encryption here and a little bit of <coughs> teaspoon of authentication there. We can make this work. And then there's a few more things you need. You need extra sequence numbers now so you can prevent from replay attacks and so forth. But it's, it's definitely not another layer, and it's, it's very tightly coupled. So this is a picture of a state machine for the normal DNP3 protocol. Very complex, and a lot of this is just because it's an event-driven system. Very different than sort of the very simple pull response, pull response, pull response you get from Modbus. And in the specification, you have lots of different state machines, and even the security state machine, but they all act on a lot of shared data, so it's very hard for software engineers to kind of integrate this in a safe way and have a clear trust boundary. Um, so to kind of drive that, oh wow, my value didn't even appear up in the translation. That's right, I know what it is, I'll just tell you what it is. This is a pie chart of uh, the first 19 vulnerabilities that we reported last year for Project Robust, divided in a pie chart by layers of the DNP3 stack, okay? We didn't find many transporter link layer bugs. And the argument I'm making here is just a very, very simple complexity argument. And this pie chart is probably underrepresented for the green application layer because we didn't even fuzz most of the things in there, whereas we had excellent coverage of the very simple transport and link layers. So I think in reality that green part of the pie chart is actually much bigger in terms of bugs that still exist up in a very complex specification. And now look at the pie chart for source lines of code in my open DMP3 project. bugs proportional to code. Complexity is what kills us when we design systems, right? And that's the fundamental challenge of software engineering is figuring out how to, is figuring out how to manage complexity. But you can only do so much when you're given a specification that is, has a massive attack surface area. Yeah, so there's the kitten again. The kitten is that vulnerable thing that we need to protect, right? So another feature of DNP3, which I would actually go so far as to call a security anti-pattern, is, is function code whitelisting. To save bytes um, on the line, I can't think of another design use for this. They've decided that only certain function codes um, are, must be authenticated. And it's from a very engineering perspective, right? We don't want people opening our breakers, so direct operate, operate, select, those are all mandatory. The spec requires you to authenticate those. But other things like reads, responses, freeze and clear, these are optional, so those turn into configuration flags basically in vendor software. You can turn them on, you can turn them off. Well, number one, nothing is stateless in DNP3. Even a read steals events. You know, you can, you can basically steal event data from event buffers. That's not as bad as opening breakers, but it's not innocent, it's not stateless. And what this really shows is kind of misconception about what's dangerous. Yes, the engineering functions are dangerous. Yes, you don't want somebody doing an operate. But we need to drive home this concept that complex data itself is dangerous. The intended function code doesn't really matter. And if you have a porous trust boundary with you know, allowing very large um, requests and responses to be processed without authentication, you're opening yourself up for a world of pain. Um, and furthermore, every time you extend the standard, every time you add a new feature or group to DNP3, you make the security less um, less clear and less effective because you've added more attack surface area that's pre-authentication. And also, you know, just from a, another com complexity argument, there are two modes of challenges, and I'll show you, and that makes the security state, state machine even more complex. 
All right, so castles. We had some castles last year, and castles were a bad metaphor, right? Uh, I think someone called it the Nurt Bastion model of security, perimeter security, right? But I think they're actually a really good metaphor for designing protocols. Number one, you have a very clear trust boundary. You know, hopefully you don't have that one little back door for the princess to sneak out, right? You have the one main entrance that you, once someone gets in the castle, you trust them, and you make sure you trust everyone that you let in the castle. And that trust boundary and the code beneath it are very, very simple. I call that an authentication bottleneck. That code, that parsing, has to, you have to get that right because you're going to have to deal with all kinds of malformed, clever frames at that layer. And then the lower layer infrastructure, you know, whether you're on top of IP, you're going to have to trust that too, but sometimes there's really nothing you can do about that. So you could think about that kind of stuff outside the castle. It's kind of part of your infrastructure, like your roads. That's the, that's the link in the transport layers. They're, you want to keep them simple too, but sometimes it's not entirely within your control. And then in the castle, you have your kitten, the vulnerable, huge domain model thing that you want to protect, right? That's your complex application layer. And I, and I, I was, you heard uh, Alex speak this morning, and he was talking about you know, spaghetti design. That's what standards become over time. And that's just a natural process of you know, vendor A, vendor B, committee member X, Y, and Z all getting their say. That's going to happen. It's really hard to avoid. But if you put it inside your authentication trust boundary, you're going to have way fewer problems in terms of security vulnerabilities. So the two modes of authentication. Um, with DNP3 SA, the reason that they have the challenge response option is so you can save the bytes and basically do the optional function code whitelisting. Because then you can send the message, and if the outstation doesn't want to challenge it, it'll just process it. If it's what it deems to be a critical function code, it will challenge it. But then some committee members, I presume, said, well, what if we want a system where it challenge everything? Aren't we wasting a lot of bytes sending four messages to what it only took two to do before? So they have another mode called aggressive mode. And aggressive mode is just one pass authentication where your HMAC is kind of already on the object, it's already pre authenticated, and you send it. So I should offer you the chance here to take the red pill or the blue pill. But since it's S4, we're just going to take the red pill. So let's take a look here at uh, parsing complexity of this thing. This, is, uh, this doesn't have all the details of a DNP3 application layer frame. Um, I've kind of like summarized things, but at the very front, you have a header that has some sequence numbers, you have a function code. And then in aggressive mode, the first object is a user object that says, who, who requested this operation? It has that challenge sequence number that protects you from replay attacks that you validate. And then you have the headers you care about, right? If it's a write operation, maybe that's, you have a time object. If it's a operate, then you have a control relay output block or a set point. And then all the way at the tail end, um, you have your message digest that you're going to check before you process it, right? Um, so you, basically all that data at the beginning, that's what gets hashed in with your session key and your nonce basically to produce your HMAC, which you validate. How hard could this be, right? I think a lot of people looked at the spec and be like, oh, okay, that's right. How hard could this be? It's actually really, really hard to get right. Um, the first problem with this is that the packet itself is pretty ambiguous. If you get the packet and you haven't parsed to see that first object, you don't know if this is a regular request or it's an aggressive mode request. So you have to speculatively parse the first header to see if a special magic object is there, which is the, the user challenge sequence number object to say, oh, this is an aggressive mode request. There must be an HMAC at the end. That kind of ambu ambiguity I'm not comfortable with in a security protocol. That's, that's really kind of dangerous. You don't want people kind of having kind of special case parsing for something that already has like a generic parser. That's, that's really dangerous, number one. Um, <laughs> and so now we've identified this as aggressive mode. We want to validate this package. We want to get to the HMAC. How do we get there? Well, DNP3 headers, they can't be skipped. It's not like some protocols like you know, uh, MMS where it's all tag length value, tag length value. You can't skip it. You know, to get to the next header, you have to do some parsing, right? It might be like a start-stop header, and you have to know the size of the objects, and you do a calculation that has all kinds of possible hard integer overflows. So you know, there's your kitty again. You're having to process data that is completely irrelevant to you're not going to even process it yet until you've authenticated. So that's, that's really, really dangerous. 
Um, fortunately, there is a workaround for this particular case, but it's not documented anywhere in the standard. Because you know the length of the HMAC, because there's a lot of different like uh, hash algorithms you could use. It could be SHA-1, it could be truncated to 10 bytes. And you know the size of the header, you can speculatively look to see if it's at the end of the packet. Treat that stuff in the middle as just an opaque blob of bytes. And then um, basically authenticate before actually processing all that stuff. So there is a way out, but it's definitely not by design. It's not in the protocol. And I'm really curious how many vendors who have implemented the spec have kind of, you know, attempted not to look at that really complex, untrusted data. I I'm not really sure. Well, you know, what could we do differently with the requirements that we had? We had requirements that it be uh, multi-drop, that it not, you know, impart too much overhead on the communication link. We should just do layers. You know, if those are your requirements, section off that complex application layer data. You know, treat it as a layer. Don't try to do sec mix security stuff in with your SCADA stuff. Um, create a very, very simple envelope that's easy to parse, has a very simple state machine for the session key exchanges, and is completely separate from the application layer of these protocols. And then if you're authenticating everything, you, you don't even need the challenge response. You're just going to sign everything and send it. So you have very regular traffic patterns. Um, I mean, I would much prefer for protocol bodies who are thinking about this not to attempt uh, security kind of at their existing application layers that are very bloated. And then also you have a very clear software or, or trust boundary rather for software engineers. They know that if I make this call from the authentication layer to layer above me, I better trust the data. It's very clear from the spec and it's very clear from the code where that trust boundary is. And if you want to do authorization based on the function code, you can, right? If you have multiple users here, one's allowed to do operates and one's not, but it's very clear that you're separating authentication from authorization. You know, another thing, it's like, can we really afford this kind of divergence for every protocol in the industry? And I have an electric power bias, so I'm going to tell you kind of some of the things going on in electric power. We have a standard uh, called IEC 62351 with lots of subsets that define basically how you do for security for certain standards within this industry. And 62351-5 is a high level overview that says you should use these crypto primitives, it should be authentication only, it kind of spells out the high level things you should do. And then we have mappings in the protocols. And if anyone's with, anyone does work with IEC 104 and you know kind of where they are in that process, I'd love to talk to you. And then there's also kind of a separate one for 61850, and I kind of fear that some of these standard bodies are going to fall into that same trap of thinking about adding security into the existing protocol versus kind of, you know, limiting the surface area and kind of doing it right. Don't think of those function codes as the authentication is not just there to authorize the user, it's to protect you from malicious data as well. And then also, if, if, you, if you're in a multi-protocol environment, uh, owner-operators, they have to understand this stuff if they want to debug it. The more complex you make it, the more you're going to have to pay consultants to, you know, figure out how it all works. You know, and if we're going that far, you should also ask the question, you know, why would we not put the auth wrapper down below the layer of these protocols themselves? And there with DNP3 and some of the legacy common infrastructure, I can kind of see a legitimate argument because if you put an HMAC at the end of every single link layer message, it does add a lot of overhead. Because now instead of like 2K messages with a 10 byte trailer, you're chopping up like, you know, maybe every 200 bytes or so. So there, there could be some impact there. And then your auth wrapper also has to understand addressing for multi-drop. But I would really prefer to see this kind of standard rethink this and kind of put a layer between the transport layer and application layer. So, um, in summary, I mean, these are kind of software engineering things when it comes to security. It's not things that a lot of protocol bodies think about, but have a clear trust boundary. Keep it simple. Don't mix app and security layers. And for the asset owner operators over there who are thinking about picking a secure protocol, make sure you understand kind of what some of the design trade-offs are versus, you know, integration and wrapping and why things are encryption only. You know, I think that's important. And uh, any time you see a really complex security spec, that's probably a red flag. That's, that's dangerous, because you, ha you have to protect your kitten. Know where your complexity is. That's it. Great.
Thank you. So do we have some questions for Adam? I'll get one over there. Did this, um, as I walk over there, was, oh, and there's one there too. Um, did the Langsec presentation you saw last year flavor you at all on this? Because they I were talking about. I may have been talking to Sergey a little bit since then, yeah. Yeah, some of those, pro, some of those layers and, and worrying about that yeah. sounded very familiar to what he said. No, what he say really resonates with me, so, yeah. yeah. Hey, I appreciate your talk. Uh, Zach Tudor, SRI. Those who don't know me are the new people, right? Um, but um, I, I appreciate your talk, and, and as a, also not a crypto guy, um, I was looking up some of the, the design rationale for SA as it went through, and so mm -hmm. um, you have to realize that they had a totally different set of uh, design threats that they were dealing with, and so they chose to do it at the application layer because doing it at a lower layer would prevent it from being bridged, and you have to sometimes cross different right. physical boundaries. So there's, there's so many ways to skin the cat. Um, and but in that particular use case, I mean, having it be a layer between the transport layer and the application no layer, <laughs> it still goes over serial. It still goes over serial. So I think, it, I think that that design that I proposed actually meets most of those very special case use cases. Okay. All right, good, thanks. Yep. I think we, Corey, yeah, over there. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Mike Tucker. Um, I noticed that even though you were talking SAVV, SAV6 mm -hmm. in that slide, you didn't, actually, you didn't actually call out the application layer as DNP3. Was that intentional? Like, are you thinking other protocols for this? Uh, well, I mean, I think some of this stuff is already out there. I mean, I think people should be reusing some of the stuff that PNNL does. I mean, SCCP is a really simple serial wrapper that can be integrated. Maybe it doesn't have some of the things like asymmetric cryptography or whatever, but yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely reuse. I mean, the link layer and the transport layer in DNP3, all it is is all it does is basically get a message of a certain length to the next layer. That's all it does. So that layer that I'm proposing in between, its only purpose is basically authentication, and it's passing any type of data up. So yeah, I mean, you could. It's it's hard to get IEC and IEEE to agree on things, but it's possible. I think that. Timing is, is very interesting because you have a lot of these protocols now starting. I mean, it's probably yeah. a two or three year process before they get there, but like Ethernet IP and some of these other protocols saying, how are we going to secure them? It's, it's a good thing to think about at the front end before they start the spec. Introduce yourself. Hi, Watan Bar, Limpox. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of authentication and encryption in the presentation, but I saw nothing regarding integrity and sequence, uh, mm. packet sequence. Uh, sorry, I don't quite understand the, the question. There is no mechanism that you offered that will support the verification that packets have arrived and they are not corrupted. And in the oh, same order. Are you order. talking about data errors or are you talking about data, data integrity? Well, that's what, the, um, that's what the DNP3 link layer provides. It has a 16-bit CRC. So, you know, it's just like Ethernet, which has a 32-bit CRC that handles the data errors. So SSCP, um, by comparison, does have CRCs because it is the lowest layer on serial. Whereas this, you know, when I'm proposing an authentication layer for DNP3 that's not part of the app layer, doesn't need data error because the link layer is already providing that. Yep. So that would be no different than TLS, right? TLS. It gets a stream and processes it. Uh, so, Adam, I, I fully support uh, you know the notion of of thinking early on this and and designing solutions that are easy to implement because, frankly, no matter how good it is on paper, the implementation is where yeah. it actually matters at. Um, I'll, I'll point you and the rest of the audience to a paper that uh, University of Illinois published in two thousand ten. Um, when we reviewed DNP3 SA, it's called uh, Design Principles for Power Grid Cyber Infrastructure Authentication Protocols, um, which was published at the 43rd um, Annual HICS in uh, 2010. You can Google and get that paper um, directly mm -hmm. off of the internet without having to pay any fees or anything like that. Um, but it talks about many of the issues that you have and, and some of the design considerations to go in early on that. To speak specifically to DNP3 SA, um, 
there was lots of reasons why they did what they did, which um, Zach has there. And there are a lot of things they wanted to accomplish that they failed to, like non-repudiation and integrity protection, yeah. um, and actually opened up doors originally in, in it to cause bigger issues by implementing it rather than, than not. So um, I guess the, the simple thing is, is they tried to do what they were told to do, which is use 62351-5. Yep. Um, but fundamentally, 62351-5 was flawed. So. I, you know, I, I'm not questioning the crypto primitives here. I'm really just questioning the way it's even mapped the crypto into, primitives were, were flawed. <laughs> okay, I'm really just que I'm just questioning the way it's mapped onto um, something that's implementable in terms of the spec. So, yeah. And, and I guess we should give them a little bit of credit in that they actually tried. Absolutely. To do a you know, protocol, it's hard work. It's hard pretty, work. These pretty much ahead. Yeah. The budget for the entire DNP3 technical committee, and this is a protocol used by the entire United States power industry, and this is available, is almost, it's just 100 grand a year. It's almost entirely people doing stuff based on volunteer work. So if we don't get software engineers, or we don't, you know, at vendors, or we have large vendors who are not members. So, you know, we have a real participation problem from people that we need to hear from. Question in the corner there. Hey, Adam. Dar yep. Darren Highfill here. Um, with PwC, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, obviously, from last year's presentation, a big Langsec fan, um, <clears throat> and I like the references that you that you put in there. I find it interesting, though. The seems like there's kind of this uh, back and forth pull mentally in my mind between the you know the the choke point the choke point model where you consolidate so much security effort into one point. Mm -hmm. um, versus actually having some security thought and approach built into the whole system. Um, and so, you know, I, I found myself as you were going through the presentation thinking, is this somehow going to give the application writers, uh, you know, a free pass that now they get to do whatever they want and they basically yeah. you use that, that layer kind of like a VPN. Once you get past it, you're golden. That's a great question, and I'm, perhaps I failed to kind of illustrate the differences between uh, trust models for system and defense in depth versus the microcosm that is a single software process. You, you, you don't want, you, you've authenticated at that one point. You know, that doesn't mean that you're given carte blanche not to test past that, right? But it does lessen the severity of any vulnerabilities that are past that. What that means is that if I'm a vendor and I have a certain budget for testing, and it's a secure protocol, I should weight my testing towards the pre-authentication pre surface area. Doesn't mean don't do any testing because you can have interoperability robustness bugs. Yeah, sure, they were both authenticated, but vendor A said something that vendor B didn't, and you, know, you had downtime in the system, but that's, you're generally less worrying about an attacker in those kind of situations. Because okay. if they've got your credentials, they're gonna own you anyway. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that was great. Thanks.